Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles to the Angelo Robles podcast, or at least on Apple, Spotify, Our Heart, and those platforms, and the founder of SFO Continuity and my new Family Office TV. So many of you may know me more on YouTube as at Family Office, which I do love. Those tend to be more investing-centric conversations, but I'm also launching, and by the time you watch this, Family Office TV on YouTube and possibly as an own URL platform that I do own will be up and that will be more broad family office topics, but obviously that includes economics and investing so David will our guest today will probably have the honor of making it up on both platforms how lucky am I. Uh, so really, really excited great to be here as always how billionaires should navigate the financial markets. Our special guest today, a returning guest for the third time, it looks like about once a year, is David Hunter, contrarian macro strategist with 50 years on Wall Street. David, welcome back. Hi, Angela. Great to see you. Thanks for having me back. Well, thank you. You're always one of our most popular guests. I enjoy our conversations and I like the fact that you don't hold back and you let your opinions rip and that is great. So on that front, let's get right to it. Most data points, and you're probably going to maybe disagree a little bit, David, but most data points indicate that a recession is coming. Leading economic indicators have been coming sharply lower. Consumer expectations are extremely pessimistic. And unemployment, well, it's starting to tick higher. Yeah, quite the contrary. I actually agree with all of that um, and I have been probably have been more bearish on the economy than almost anybody on the street. That's what people don't understand because I have a melt-up forecast, but I have a melt-up forecast in uh, when expecting the economy to decelerate. It's actually held up better than I expected so far and probably will hold up uh, a bit better, it seems, for you know uh, several more months. So, um, but you know, I'm calling for a global bust next year uh, something worse than a recession. So I actually agree with all of that. Okay, let's probably pile on. How about that? The inversion <laughs> of the yield curve has been ringing the alarm for a while. The phenomenon where the yield on longer term bonds fall below that of shorter term bonds has historically been a reliable indicator of an impending economic downturn which you probably definitely agree is happening sometime next year. But how about in the next 12 months? Yeah, I, I, you know, the hard part is to know, obviously, when it actually triggers. And part of the problem is, how are we measuring the economy? You know, are we measuring it in G GDP? Are we looking at other things? So, you know, in some ways, and there are people making the argument, we're in recession already. Um, and, For sure. um, but what I do see, I'm, I'm not to jump around, but I am expecting rates to uh, roll over here and head lower. Um, and ultimately sharply lower. But I think we could see a two and a half percent 10 year within certainly the next six months, maybe even the next three months. If you get that, that's only going to probably help um, sustain housing and help sustain auto sales and things. So it just looks like we're probably going to push um, the ultimate downturn out until late this year, um, at least. So, so in that respect, I I think we're you know we're stretching the cycle, but I still believe 2024 is going to be perhaps the worst downturn in the last um, certainly in the post World War II era. Wow, that, that that's that's really stark. I mean, we were probably going to get into some of the big picture opportunity for family offices investors, but like you were on 15 months ago, unfortunately, and we're probably both on the same page, in the coming years, probably more likely in the 2030s, it could be a really, really time of great strife. Uh, picking the can further and further, well, we've been doing that kind of forever. Look at our deficit and look at the you know, the unfunded pension liabilities, the derivatives markets, uh, shadow, they, there's so much going on where there's only so long, especially with the dollar being the all powerful, which it will be for the relatively short term, but 
These are all things now The BRICS are creating opportunities backed by commodities. It's going to be an alternative. We're going to get to some of the bigger picture macro, but just kind of setting the stage for the audience, which is why we have so much to talk about. Staying a little bit more on point, the March banking crisis, geez, it seems like we all forgot about that. The March banking crisis, at least at the time, heightened fears of a broader impact on the economy. The fear of a crisis is spreading and causing significant disruptions, at least in the financial sector, contributing to the prevailing sentiment that, again, a recession is on the horizon. Um, that's true. And I, I viewed March as and, and the regional banking crisis as a shot across the bow. It was kind of an early warning signal that the Fed has stayed the tight side too long and is still misunderstanding the leads and lags to their policy. And as a result, they are continuing to tighten. As you know, they're pushing for even more rate hikes here, at least, at least suggesting they could come, whether we'll see them or not. Um, and I do believe there is going to be a far larger banking crisis. In fact, I'm calling for, and again, not to stretch this out, but calling for potentially the biggest financial global financial crisis in history next year. So I, I think March was an early signal, but that doesn't mean it's imminent. I think we are um, probably going to look at you know the banks just kind of slowly moving towards uh, more and more problems. You know, you got earnings out today and some things, you know, some received it positively, but they're still under the surface. There's still plenty of things to worry about. Um, and you look at the state of the consumer and, you know, his delinquencies are going up. Yes, they're spending more, but they're, you know, they're pretty stretched. And what, what seemingly is going on out there is that the consumer is saying, at least for this summer, we want to have our cake and eat it too. We want to be able to travel. We may not be able to do this next year, but we're going to do it this year. So they're they're you know they're putting more on their credit cards, I think, to buy airline tickets to to uh, pay for their hotels, etc. And they're spending. They're going to restaurants, etc. And but what we're seeing elsewhere is that they're pulling it somewhat from, for example, the consumer area from the retail area and you know, not spending as much on goods. So I, I think the consumer, as has been the case for many decades, is still a shop till you drop. You know, they still wanna spend the money if they think there's any chance that they're okay. Um, but the danger signs are there under the surface. And I think it's gonna impact banks, it's gonna impact the consumer, it's gonna impact the economy. Well, I mean, yes, I, mean, I, can't, I guess I can't let that one go. So we do got to dive a little bit deeper into that. Absolutely. It does seem like the consumer in America is spending like crazy. They seem to know there's like doom and gloom that likely is ahead. Uh, going back a little bit to our government's decision, the Fed, whatever, uh, the SEC, whatever it may be, the banking crisis that we had back in March, do you think that they addressed it well to... to uh, quell off fears or was it really just a band-aid on something that's going to totally bust in a year or so uh i would i would say it's certainly a band-aid um i think it i think they did a good job of taking care of the problem in the short run i mean that's pretty clear from what we've seen in the three months that followed um you know they they did act quickly um they viewed it as um isolated relatively isolated um, even though, as you know, Wall Street was screaming, this is across the regional um, sector, regional bank sector. This is going to, you know, there were a lot of people predicting gloom and doom right around the corner. And uh, to their credit, I think they saw the, you know, Silicon Valley and Republic, et cetera, were somewhat isolated in terms of the, the extremes, that it was poor bank decisions that drove a lot of it. Um, and, and that the, the larger, more macro problem for the banking industry of a, a severely inverted yield curve, yes, it weakened the banks, but many of them managed their way through it much better than did Silicon Valley uh, or some of the other ones that got in trouble. So, so I think, you know, I'd give them probably a, a, a B minus for what they did in the short run. It does not fix the problem. And a big part of the problem is, uh, a very big, what I think is potentially going to be one of the biggest 
um, policy errors ever made by central banks. And what exactly is that policy error in your opinion? Um, it's, it's again, uh, a Fed that is focused on the here and now, not understanding leads and lags, and therefore not understanding that they've already created the seeds for a bust and are continuing to you know, make it even, you know, go even further with their tightening. You know, they give lip service to leads and lags, but they, they still act like they want to manage policy to the current data. I, I don't know how you can do it both ways. <laughs> huh. Exactly. Looking a little bit forward and staying in line with my title, if you're an exceptionally affluent individual, could I ask the question, other than maybe shorting and arbitrage and certain benefits, you want to be helpful to your community, put a little bit of money here and there. But for the most part, why would you have your money, your available liquidity and cash and anything but a significantly large bank, probably quasi diversified, if not globally, like the, the banking is going to consolidate don't you think it's obvious yeah i i am not in the camp that thinks we're you know we're gonna uh follow the uh canadian or european model i i i do think we're going to see community banks continue i do think we're going to see a very uh robust regional sector there are obviously problems particularly in the uh commercial real estate sector that it's heavily concentrated in the regional banks so there are things that are gonna happen next year in what I call the global bust that are gonna hit many of those banks. Um, but I, I am not in the camp that thinks we're going the way of you know all JP Morgan and the big banks. I, I do think we're gonna have both, but there's gonna be a stretch here where the regional banks, you know, the, the strong ones are gonna survive and the weak ones are gonna you know, go, by, go by the wayside one way or the other. And I promise, audience, we're going to get to even things like perhaps uh, prognostications and the impact on the markets with the upcoming election in the U.S. heading into next year. We will probably talk a little bit about Trump. We'll talk about a lot of issues. So I tend to do rather long form. Actually, an hour and a half today is probably a little bit on the short side, but we'll try to do the best we could getting to a lot of topics. Let's turn our attention a little bit to inflation. Unlike recent cycles, inflation has been a genuine concern and has exhibited some degree of resilience, even in the face of the Fed's historical hawkishness. Uh, how do you think this will play out in the coming months? I am in the camp that in coming months, meaning next year, uh, not only are we heading for a global bust, but we're heading for a global deflationary bust. So I think the risk here is deflation, not inflation. Um, obviously, there. You know, everybody knows that there's uh, various uh, calculations out there. True inflation's numbers are out there showing that inflation is down to two percent already. Um, I again, I believe it's that lead and lag. We are trending, and I've been consistent with this for the last year. We are trending. Uh, inflation is trending down. It doesn't mean every month it's going to cooperate, but inflation is moving towards that two percent target, and in in some respects, it's already there. Um, the Fed is not understanding that by the time they see their 2%, they've gone way, way past the time that it, it should have been reversed. So, uh, you know, their policy should have been reversed. So I, I think inflation is not our issue here. Again, I'm not trying to predict the next month's inflation or whatever, but we do know the indexes have a bias where you you know you have the rental factor the real estate factor in the cpi uh is overstating inflation in in the you know the housing area so so i do think that the likelihood is the numbers are going to continue to surprise on the downside um and either way whether you get a surprise to the upside in any one month the trend is definitely down and i think the fed has already done its job in terms of getting inflation down and what they risk here, in fact, I think have already created is future deflation. And, and that, let me just say that, that can, when, when you couple in the fact that we've got 300 trillion in global debt and quadrillions in notional value of derivatives, what I call that is leverage on the market. So when you look at those two forms of leverage at levels that we've never entered a cycle um, ever, ever been here before, 
it's way beyond anything we saw in 2008, nine, and certainly well beyond anything we've seen in the history. When, when you have a Fed make a uh, go too far on the tight side, as I think they have, it's magnified by the fact that we have a far more leveraged system, not just here, but all around the world. Um, that, that just means the policy error is, is that greater, that much greater. In terms of moving forward with the Fed, given your uh, beliefs on inflation and the, the numbers, I guess, seem to point that out, uh, do you think they're going to raise rates heading into the next uh, time they do so or not or stay flat? Yeah, well, let me put it this way. I, I th think they've certainly given plenty of lip service to the fact that July is going to be a rate increase. Unless there's, there's one caveat, I, I'd say you know, the odds are, and certainly the market is discounting the expectation we're gonna get a rate hike next week. Um, the, so the odds favor that. Do, do I think they should? No, but I certainly think they probably believe it's already baked in the cake. You know, the market's already discounted it, what have you, let's, you know, let's not waste it. And you, if you believe their rhetoric, their thinking is, we wanna err on the side of going too far because if we let inflation, pick up again, it's going to be that much harder a job to to bring to rein it in. So so I think given that mindset, I'd say the odds are July's a hike. I think it's a crapshoot whether September's a hike or not, because um, you know, as I said, lower rates in the bond market could stimulate housing a bit more and autos a bit more. And they might in September say we we're, you know, we're seeing too much Good stuff in the economy. We got to still hike, so I, I think one or two and done is probably the most likely. And I don't know whether it's one or two or zero. <laughs> um, what I would say beyond that, though, is I think there's a thesis out there that's very likely. If I'm right about, and I'm jumping ahead, but if I'm right about my melt-up thesis, and the S and P gets anywhere near my targets, we can talk about those later. But you know, six thousand S and P plus. I think knowing, knowing how much Powell was paying attention to Bill Dudley's thesis about the stock market needing to be down to 3,000 or lower uh, to rein in, you know, to, to tighten financial conditions in order to get inflation down, that's still, I believe, driving a lot of what they're saying and doing out there. If you get a market that instead of going towards 3,000 goes towards 6,000, I can see them coming right back, even if even if they don't do anything uh, in July or September. I can see them coming back next fall and saying, "My God, you know, look look what's going on in the stock market. We have to hike." In other words, I think they're making a mistake in focusing on the stock market, but I still believe they are trying to establish the fact that there's no more Fed put, trying to establish the fact that. Um, they they want the market down. I think a lot of that's why it's a little hard to know what they're going to do month to month, because uh, the street takes them as they're looking at inflation. I think the other thing that they're looking at with a um, one of their at least a, a pretty large um, focus is uh, the stock market. So they may be just jawboning. You know, they what? Uh, that's what I felt at their last meeting. They came out. Not only you know, they paused. They called us. You know, you can call it a skip, but they paused. But in the in the conference that followed, the press conference that followed, and in the Fed speak that followed the, in the next few weeks, it was clear that they wanted to send the message: we're not done, right? Yeah. So why why would you pause? other than maybe they were a little worried that they don't know about that lead and lag, what it's going to bring. But why would you pause and then spend all your time trying to um, tell everybody you're going to hike again? Hmm. I think, I think they were, I think Powell was very fearful of what he got in August of 2022 or July of 2022, really when the street jumped on the fact that, you know, maybe the Fed's done or, you know, maybe rate hikes are, are not coming. And he had to come back in, you know, at Jackson Hole in August of last year 
and jawbone the market down. And, and then they had to come back in September and hike rates aggressively. He doesn't want that again. So he, you know, he spent the last 10 months trying to jawbone the market down. He, you know, every time the market lifted its head, you know, certainly late last year and early this, he had his minions come out. Every FOMC governor would come out and tell you how rates are going a lot higher. And what was that about? That was to scare yeah. the market down. So, so I think that's a piece of what the Fed is doing. And I think that's problematic, as I have said. And again, I know I'm jumping ahead, but as I have said, um, I think a, a FOMC, a Fed chairman, should never think he knows where the market belongs. That's not his job. That's not his expertise. Greenspan had his head handed to him with his, you know, rational exuberance speech. You know, the market went up for several years after that, right? He decided the market was overvalued. Well, it went a lot further. Um, Powell's had his head handed to him, or at least had his credibility questioned a little bit, because for the last year, he's been telling you the market was going to go to 3,000. He didn't specifically say that, but that's what he wanted. And he kept telling you, you know, they kept trying to jawbone it down. And what's the market done? Instead of going down, it went up a thousand points. So, you know, I mean, really think of it. 3,500 in October of 2022, he was, you know, he was convincing everybody the market was going lower. And he's, he's every month since, he's tried to jawbone it lower and he had no success. It went the opposite direction. So, so I think the Fed should understand their focus should be on the economy, on interest rates, on inflation. It should not be on the stock market. And in fact, the stock market's probably one of his, if not his best, one of his best leading indicators. It's a far better forecaster of what's coming than, than are the FOMC economists. So, so I, I think he's, by, by deciding where the stock market should be, he's taking away his best leading indicator. Ah, I mean, that brings up a bigger picture point. I guess you kind of answered it. Look at the resources at the Fed. The U.S. Fed, the king of all central banks for now, has at their fingertips uh, basically everything, but hundreds and hundreds of talented people, or at least smart people, maybe not necessarily talented. Uh, but all these reports and all the data that they're able to analyze as an economist, and maybe that's the problem, uh, and they're wrong a lot. Like they have resources that probably no one bank, no one family office has. And yet sometimes with them, it's like putting darts on a board. Yeah. It's, well, why am I, why am I a, a contrarian? <laughs> 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 I mean, <laughs> frankly, I've spent 50 years watching economists get it wrong, right? Every cycle. They, in, in 2008-9, in September of 2008-9, not even a month before couple of weeks, three weeks before um, the biggest financial crisis in the post-World War II era. Um, the vast majority, almost every economist on Wall Street was saying soft landing, no recession in sight. Two and three weeks before it's, it kicked in, before Lehman. Um, I was one of the very few saying hard landing ahead, watch out. And the economists were saying, no, I don't see any sign of a recession. So they do it every cycle. It's not just the Fed economists. It's so many of the economists. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, you learn that they and again, where's where's the problem? The problem lies, in my opinion, on um, they the Fed is not market savvy. They they don't, what our, our qualifications for a, um, a member of the FOMC is typically an economist or somebody with a lot of um, economic background. We don't, we don't have people with market skills in there. You know, Jay Powell's not even an economist, he's an attorney, but, but um, or a lawyer by training, but he, he also has, you know, he was a private, um, he was in the private markets. He wasn't in the you know, the public market. So he doesn't have a lot of understanding of how markets discount things well in advance. And I, again, the success I've had in forecasting cycles is understanding what the leading indicators are, what the things are that you can look at that can give, give you clues to the future. It's not gonna be precise, but I'm gonna get a lot closer 
than most of the economists who are basically looking at current data and too often extrapolating that current data. Uh, a kind of more of a big picture point, arguably ramble. Again, I hinted, well, I didn't hint it. I noted earlier, we have a massive deficit. We have, again, unfunded liabilities and pensions and with states, a million different things going wrong. And yes, basically every other country in the world has problems too, I get it. Uh, that coupled with the GDP issues and slow, and we're slower or slowing down, uh, and population growth, which obviously in only a few parts of the world is increasing, it's decreasing. Yet you mentioned deflation uh, is technology advancements that we'll even see in AI coupled with one day free energy or close to it, a deflationary force is at work now, but that appears a little too soon. Yeah, this, this deflation, I believe, is very macro driven. I am, yeah. you know, I'm not talking about technological advancements um, or the pressures on labor on wages uh, from AI, et cetera. I'm really speaking of, as I put it in a formula, um, it's massive leverage plus economic fragility called uh, caused by um, a pandemic, a global pandemic. Um, as you know, we shut down the world economy for a quarter, that's unseen, unheard of. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems underlying the economy because of what happened during a you know three-year pandemic. Um, so you you take leverage plus the economic fragility um, plus what I said before is potentially the largest policy error in in uh, central bank history um, equals global deflationary bust. So I think it's the combination of leverage like we've never seen before fragility caused by something we hadn't, you know, they hadn't been in previous cycles recently. Um, plus, you know, not just Fed, but central banks around the world over tightening into that leverage. And you can, you can end up with a, a very um, steep downturn. And because of the, the leverage, end up with a very big financial, you know, a lot of involuntary debt liquidation, a lot of bank failures around the world. Um, that's what I'm talking about when I say greatest financial crisis in history. I don't think it's necessarily the U.S. bank so much because we got hit so hard in 2089 and we've got some religion. But counterparty risk, you know, the big banks certainly are dealing in, in global markets with the banks that are going to get hit. So they can, they can take, take some pretty big lumps. But it's, I think it's the European banks, the, you know, Australian Canadian banks are, you know, Canadian banks didn't learn our lesson. They were in great shape in 2008, nine compared to us. Now they are us. <laughs> they look like we did yes. then. So, so I think it's banks outside of the U S that are probably going to be the, you know, certainly the catalyst. Uh, and it can spill over here just because I think it's going to be, you know, the global downturn is going to be pretty, pretty dire. What initially was touted as driven by supply chain disruptions has permeated, I guess you could say, in various sectors such as housing services, wages, and tradable goods. Do you see that as well or feel differently? Um, yeah, it's, I mean, supply chain complicated it. You know, it certainly, I think it's been some of both. We've, you know, inflation's been uh, certainly driven by supply chain, but there's other things. Um, that are driving it now, and and what you're you're kind of seeing the consumer, you know, the, or the uh, the worker demanding wages. Um, the government handouts made it harder for employees to find workers, so they had to pay more wages. So it kind of it does go back to supply side or go back to the pandemic, but it's it's policies have been enacted since then too, or or you know the the follow-ons from that. Um, so it, it, you can't just call it transitory. I mean, there's some real stuff there. Um, and certainly, you know, money printing and, and um, you know, all the government expenditure during the pandemic is, is part of it too. That is for sure. Uh, equities always bottom, <clears throat> always bottom during strong <laughs> recessions. <laughs> Whenever you think something, it's always going to be the opposite next time, of course. Traders often believe stocks, as I said, bottom during recessions. Historically, equity, 
equities bottom either around market monetary easing or reacceleration of economic activity. Is it different this time? Well, yes, I, I, it's not so much different. I, I have taken a lot of grief um, in the last year until very recently because I started talking about a melt up. And, and by the way, just to clarify, I, I had a melt up call in March of 2020 uh, when everybody was calling for a much lower, when the market, when the SP was at 2200 and people were thinking it was going to, you know, fall through the floor, I was saying S and P 4000 plus melt up. We had a melt up in 2020 and 2021 because I get accused of having a melt up call that I'm still talking. I go, that was a separate melt up. Ah. We had a melt up in 2020 and 2021 when the market more than doubled in 21 months. This, it's very rare to have melt ups and yet we're gonna have two within three years. So, but people need to understand the melt up I'm talking about now and have been talking about for the last you know, year um, is a, a separate new melt up. It's not the same forecast. And um, it, uh, I lost my train of thought in terms of what your question was. <laughs> Well, I mean, it was more of a big picture thought on supply chain. To, uh, uh, no, that was actually the prior one. Equity is always bottom effectively. Oh, oh yeah. So, so I here I was in the midst of a bear market last year talking about a melt up and people thought you're, you're bearish calling for a bust and you're, you're telling us we're going to have a melt up on the way to that bust. And it's very confusing because, um, you know, you started off the program with, with pretty negative stuff. And I said, I actually agree with it. It's hard for people to understand how can I be bullish on the market, and I'm very bullish on the market here, and yet have such a dire forecast imminently, you know, fair, fairly soon, within six, nine months, talking about an economy that may be the worst in the post-World War II era. But it's because sentiment got so negative so fast last year. You had you had more you had more unanimity among the bears you know, bearish unanimity than we almost ever have had. And it was clear to me as a contrarian that that just wasn't gonna stand. With everybody on one side of the boat and with the likelihood that we were, you know, we were gonna not drop off the face of the earth economically immediately, there was gonna come a kind of a sweet spot in there where rates are coming down, the dollar's going lower and the market can go up. And all these people are positioned wrong and have to reposition. And that's exactly where we are right now. I mean, that's why we're up a thousand points on the S&P. And I believe we're going to rise another easily 1,500 points, maybe 2,500 points from here before the end of the year. Uh, okay, let's go a little back and forth somewhat on that. Stocks are expensive by many metrics. For example, the earning yield on the S&P 500, 12 months forward, is now around the same levels, uh, the yield as the U.S. corporate investment grade bonds and the rate of three-month treasuries. How does that impact into your decision about how it could be a melt -up? Yeah, first of all, I expect, um, and I think 10 years is an important rate. I expect the 10 year, as I said, to go to two and a half from here. So we were just at 4% or a little higher. It's going to drop 150 base points or a little more. And I think that happens you know, maybe by September, maybe maybe a little further out, but but the rates are going to be trending down from here. They're not going up. I think short rates will will be doing the same thing shortly, um, as people realize inflation has been taken care of and the economy is continuing to track towards recession. Um, so um, so interest rates are going to be a wind at our back as as equity investors. Um, the dollar has broken. I have a forecast of an 80 on the DXY hmm. um, for, it doesn't have to happen by the end of the year, but we're on our way there. So we, it could be first quarter next year, we see it. Um, but we're, we're gonna probably see 90 in the, in the next few months on our way to 80. Um, that's a huge um, help to certainly the commodity sector, the industrial sector makes us much more competitive on our exports. Um, True. And, and it certainly helps in the translation effect on the multinationals. So I think we're going to probably be surprised that earnings do much better than our, the consensus forecast today over the next several, you know, next couple quarters anyway. Um, 
And, and I think a big part of obviously um, what goes into discounting in, in the stock market, what, how, how we discount stock market and valuations has to do with our expectations for the economy going forward, not backward. If I believe um, that the Fed's done with their tightening cycle, and I believe the economy's decelerating, and all of a sudden um, the Fed pauses, the market's gonna go to, the next step beyond pause is cutting, right? The market's gonna go to, yeah, 23, 2023 earnings aren't gonna be great, or you know they held in there better than we expected, but they're down. 2024 earnings could be quite good because we're coming out of a recession. You know, we're going coming out of a downturn. So even though some people may think the downturn is next year, like me, I think the street as a consensus is going to gravitate to 2024 being a, a, a more of a year coming out, meaning like 1983, for example. Huh. Um, and so, so I think you're going to see earnings expectations ramp up, not go down for a period of time. Now, again, I'm calling for a global bust next year, so I don't agree with that, but that's what I think the consensus is gonna to move towards. So they're gonna have rationale. As you know, investors are market driven, are momentum driven. Of course. The reason, the reason I'm getting patted on the back the last month is because the market's breaking out. For many months, I was an idiot. You know, I didn't know what I was talking about. Now the same forecast that they call me an idiot for, they're saying, boy, were you, were you the smart guy that saw this coming? What, what's changed? Momentum, that's all that's changed. You know, the economy hasn't dramatically changed and rates have been up, not down, but, but the stock market's up. And that's whether, whether professional and retail investors alike, whether they wanna understand it or admit it or not, they're driven by the trend of the market by the momentum of the, of the tape. So as this market moves up, you're gonna see the rationale fill in behind that. And the rationale is gonna be a better 2024 earnings picture, as well as lower interest rates, as well as uh, a Fed who is no longer tightening, but in fact is wind at your back. Sounds like Shangri-La. Uh, the markets are forward looking. And the AI revolution, I could say, is real. The world is undergoing such a revolution in AI comparable, could I argue, to the internet evolution back about three plus decades ago, or the industrial revolution before that. NVIDIA's earnings have what, like it's been ridiculous. How does this impact relative to what you said about expectations for earnings and bringing now into the picture AI? Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm certainly not an AI expert. What I would say is AI is probably going to underperform expectations, but those expectations are, you're not going to probably know that for a, a while. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about short term. I mean, beyond that, AI, if you know, people are a lot smarter than me in that area, um, are saying that it's, you know, it could be as big as the internet. It could be, you know, huge down the road. And you know, not just for tech, but in other you know ways where we can, it, it can really add to productivity. So, so I can see AI as something that will be a, a softener to the, you know, the negative things that are out there going forward. Um, but I do think you know, there's certainly speculation in there. There's certainly a lot of froth built into what AI is today. Um, so you have to kind of look short term and longer term. Uh, you know, there's probably plenty of potential for AI to, to help, you know, a sector and uh, certain stocks. Um, and in the short run, I think you're probably going to see that froth continue um, and allows, you know, takes care of some of that overvaluation because people then, you know, kind of say, hey, based on the growth that we're going to get from AI, um, I can be more optimistic about, you know, future earnings. So I, th I think AI will, will be a benefit to what I call the next several months of a melt up. Um, in terms of, again, refresh my memory. Oh, in terms of, uh, well, I mentioned NVIDIA's earnings have skyrocketed and the AI revolution is arguably comparable to the internet revolution, if not even the industrial revolution in the past. Yeah, I mean, I, I 
don't have the expertise to really know that, but I do certainly say that's a possibility that it will make a difference. It doesn't affect my forecast of a melt up and then a bust. I think it's out there further. As I said, the real impact on AI, if it's as real as people say, uh, and as big as people say, um, is out in the next cycle. I don't think it's, uh, it's not gonna soften the bust or prevent the bust. It's not, I think it, it can help from an expectation standpoint, um, help feed the melt up. But even if I didn't have an AI, we were gonna have this melt up anyway. And, and what I would say is we are late in this cycle, right? You know, this is not the beginning of a new cycle, even though that may be the, the thing that kind of pushes up to, pushes up to 6,000, 7,000 on the SP, which pushes up us up there. Um, we, we are late in a cycle. That's why I believe this, you know, we, we have this melt up followed by a very steep bear market uh, all within, you know, 12 to 18 months. Um, but um, it's, we are late in the cycle. That means there is a lot of speculative fervor um, and will be as this thing moves up. Um, and you do see, you know, so it's kind of, you have to kind of balance it and understand on the one hand, you've got so many people skeptical of the market. On the other hand, if we are going into a melt-up phase here, they're gonna to move to this side and you are gonna see speculation like you haven't seen, um, euphoria like you haven't seen. And it, it's just a weird period of time because of where we are in, maybe where we are in the super cycle, you know, uh, which I define as the, the period between two depressions. So the period between the 1930s and the period between the 2030s, we're very late in that super cycle. So you get these, you know, some people might call it volatility, uh, but I'd also say it's it's the extremes. You can go to both extremes in very short periods of time, both both extremes in, in markets, but also extremes in how investors behave and expectations. Of course, and maybe a comment, and feel free to comment on my comment relative to AI. Uh, analysts or some analysts do estimate AI could replace up to 25% of current employment in developing countries, while generative AI could raise annual productivity growth by 1.5% uh, percentage points over 10 years. Uh, and this productivity could boost eventually or increase annual global GDP. Sounds a little generous, but I'm just uh, reading and learning by 7%. I don't know. We kind of covered AI pretty good in my prior question to you. If you wanted to comment that, or we'll go on to the next point. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say it's not my my area, so I'll. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to believe. I, I'd be skeptical of those kind of numbers, and I do feel that they're optimistic. I guess, I think. <laughs> I, yeah, they are optimistic, and I'll just say um, I have a lot of faith in my ability to do macro, and I think the macro factors coming in the next decade uh, will blow away anything AI, uh, AI can do in terms of offsetting that. Now we went a little bit of negative and positive uh, in terms of some broad seven or eight questions. I guess what could go wrong? So the market is estimating what, 25 to 35% probability of a recession in the US. A market crash would require information shock such as significant deviations in inflation, PMIs, adverse geopolitical developments, which, yeah, like are happening every day, or dismal earnings season, specifically maybe for big tech. Yeah, well, certainly not now. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that last part of it with this. My forecast, my target for SMH, the semiconductor um, ETF, I had a target of 400 pre-bust, I mean, pre-split and, and pre-bust. Um, they, they split two for one. So the new target was 200, right? And it's pushing up, you know, we're not that far from that already. Um, and that was new highs, you know, went beyond the 2022 highs. I have raised that uh, to um, 250, which is, 500 before the, you know before the split, and I think I'm probably going to raise it to 300, which would be 600 before the split. We're you know we're not at 200 yet, um, so 200 to 300 would be 50 percent higher than we are today, 
and we're I don't even know where we are 175 or somewhere when you know um, so so that just tells you there's still legs to the technology here um, and AI I think is probably going to continue to be a theme in the melt in what I call the melt up um, so I don't I don't see Nvidia's bubble bursting here now when we get to the other side of the mountain I'm calling for an 80 percent bear market next year you know, and maybe starting this year, but it, most of it's next year. Um, an 80% bull market across the board, S&P, Dow, NASDAQ, Russell. Um, cool. So it's gonna, it's not just gonna be tech. So tech's gonna be in trouble at some point. I just caution people, and I'd say this about the entire market, is if you get intellectual here about some of the, the real negative things that are hanging over our head, uh, including geopolitics and everything else, you may miss the biggest rally in, in certainly in the post World War II era, ah. and maybe in history. So it's it's a really weird period because I think it can all happen very fast. I'm calling when I say melt up, I accompany that with parabolic. So it's parabolic melt up. That means you can go from say, let's say we we hit 4,800 this month. You could go from four or, five, or even 5,000, just to make it simple. So we go to new highs this month. You could be at 7,000 by October. I mean, wow. that's insane. Yes. But, but again, but. Take, take a step back and look at um, individual stocks. NVIDIA is the most recent one. Tesla last year or a couple of years ago. When you get into that late stage parabolic, Look how, how much ground you cover in a parabolic. Parabolic can be a double and a double again, you know, or whatever. Markets, you know, it's the same thing. When you go parabolic, it's covering ground in a, in a very short time that you never thought it could cover. So that's, you know, I don't think people really understand the term melt up doesn't mean a nice rally. You know, I hear people talk, um, you know, we had a 10% rally in the S&P and I heard people calling it a melt up. I go, we haven't even gotten to the melt up yet. The melt up stage is when you go parabolic and you know, you're just, you're not going to believe the ground you cover. Huh. Uh, do you agree that bond traders are the smart money? <laughs> Having been an equity guy for all my life. <laughs> um, uh, I, and, but I will say I'm a contrarian for a reason. Um, I, I think I would say bond people in general probably have um, more often than not have a better handle on, on what's going on. I think he, uh, equity people tend to be more emotional or not understand the psychology as well. But I think both get it wrong a lot. I mean, this, this most recent move in the, the 10 and 30 year, you know, the calls came out of the woodwork we were, in my opinion, we were just basically filling in some gaps. I had talked about the gaps on on the ten year back at, at uh, three ninety, and there was another one at four hundred seven. Guess what? We went to four hundred eight and reversed. Um, so I I said we're not going new highs in rates. This is just a technical thing um, driven. You know, the, the market loves to keep us off balance. If it doesn't, you get too bullish too fast, and it's over. So so I said this is this is you know, some of it has fundamental reason based on or or this is reacting to the Fed and what the Fed's talking about doing, et cetera. But but a lot of it is technical. But what, what bond investors do, or at least some of them, a lot of them, they came out of the woodwork to tell you they're, you know, we're calling for new highs on rates, right? Um, so I can't say they're always on the right side of things by any means. You know, they, they get emotional too and get caught in the tape. Um, so, but, but yeah, I, I'd say it's kind of it's kind of like the tortoise and the hare. I think the hare jumps all over the place, which is the equity market. The tortoise may be a little more steady as she goes. If we have the melt up and eventually a historic quote unquote meltdown, what will trigger the crisis and what warning will investors and people have to adapt and change what they're doing? Yeah, I'm not sure what the trigger will be. I I'm you know once you reach a top, as you know, stock market tops aren't, you don't go there, hit it one day and then the next day you're straight down. You know, tops can build for a month or two or three, or, you know, it might be that you, 
you hit you know you hit a high and then you're you're down seven or eight percent you go back part way and then you're down a lot more so i'm not sure it's necessarily a catalyst that triggers this uh, i'll go back to my statement before which is it's it's the fed policy error in this country the fair fed policy error in this country and the central bank policy error around the world is is going to be the cause of what i I'm calling an 80% bear market in in you know the S&P, Nasdaq, Dow, et cetera. Um, I I think it really is leverage plus that policy area error that causes a, a bear market that is going to be very outsized, very much larger than history, or or the typical bear market. If going back a little bit to maybe one of my questions from about 20 minutes ago, if the Fed goes back to zero, will we see the S&P go up to 10,000 and then have that 90% plus collapse? Now, actually, I, I should probably um, add on to what I said and maybe even correct myself a little bit. The catalyst to the, to the top, some of that catalyst might be what I said before, the Fed seeing the market up as high as it will be on the, on the, verge, of a, on the verge of a global bust the Fed might actually hike rates. That may be the catalyst. They may, they may focus on the stock market instead of the reality that leading indicators are pointing straight down and the consumer is starting to really struggle and you know, businesses are, are you know, starting to look troubled. And, and yet they're saying, gee, we've got to tighten some more because look where the stock market is. That may be the catalyst. Um, and again, that's a, just a, you know, one possibility, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I do think um, that ultimately stocks go where earnings go and earnings are going to get hit very hard in a, an economy that I think is going to be hit very hard. Yes. Uh, I'll take a little bit of a, a break just to give a commentary to the audience, a little bit of an update. Again, uh, David is so great. He has a very big following on Twitter. We're going to get to where you can add to that and subscribe to what he's doing as well. I know he's always been very kind and promotes my interviews with him on his Twitter. So on that note, you all should be also subscribing to what I do in terms of on my YouTube platform. Again, I have two. I have at Family Office, which tends to be more investing centric. And I have my new platform, which will be up by the time this is recorded and goes live or goes live up on the air in about two more weeks. And that is Family Office TV. Both of them are on YouTube. They're free. Subscribe to both. The Family Office TV is going to be more broad and cover more geopolitical uh, more broader macro issues and also things relative to the super rich, which you may find engaging. My Spotify, my Apple is the Angelo Robles podcast. It's easy to find. Uh, and on each of those three, there are some things I do individually for each that you won't get on an other. They're all free. Subscribe to all three. So you basically get the opportunity for everything. And I've been very fortunate, not me, it's interviewing great guests because I'm curious and hopefully bringing something intriguing out of them. Uh, I will also note on behalf probably of both myself and David that this is simply for educational and really more uh, even entertainment purposes. We're recording it, what, in mid-July and things change, opinions change. So you have your own situation relative to your liquidity needs, your cash, your income. There's a variety of different factors, your risk tolerance. You need to think for yourself. You need to make your own decisions. This is strictly at this given point in time. You may hear this a week from now, a year from now, and 10 years from now, and may laugh at maybe some of the things we said, uh, but you have to realize the time that you heard it is to impart a level of education from our opinion, uh, coupled with entertainment perspective. So, so again, you have to make your own decisions, especially when you invest. And when you invest, what could happen? Uh, you could lose all your money. It's possible. So do you understand that? Okay, we're done with that. Uh, we covered the melt up and global bust and bear cycle that will follow. Uh, we didn't talk too much about uh, the super commodity cycle that could follow and how that intertwines with this. And I am going to ask you some prognostications on silver and gold and oil. Before we get to that, broadly, how the melt up, meltdown, 
and what's going to happen with a commodity super cycle, how that's going to interweave in. Okay, so so we've talked about the melt up and why um, why we're going to see that, yes. um, and we're um, likely, um, as I said, see a global bust that lasts. 12 to 18 months, I think probably most of it's over next year. So, you know, if it's if it starts late this year, early next, it's probably mostly over by the end of next year, first quarter of 2025. The thing that shortens it, and I describe a bust, a global bust, as um, something that feels like a depression, has some of the characteristics of a depression, but happens at the speed of a recession. Um, meaning it's not drawn out like the Great Depression where it, you know was drawn out through much of a decade. Um, it's more concentrated, as I said, in a 12 to 18 month time horizon, much of it in a, a 12 month time horizon. The reason why it's so short, even though it's so severe, is because, and again, I'm saying a deflationary bust, is because in deflation, I, I think probably the easiest thing I can forecast is what the Fed will do. And that is they will have the wherewithal because it's deflation and because of leads and lags, they will have the wherewithal to print an infinite, pretty much an infinite amount of money. And that's true of not only the Fed, but all central banks, because it'll be a global deflationary bust. So, so because there's a like a 12 to 18, well, probably an 18 to 24 month lag to when you go from deflation to any kind of concerning inflation, they're not going to see it in the, you know, in the right in front of them. They're not going to be sitting there saying, "Yeah, but we are committed to inflation. We can't print money." They're going to print. They're going to say, "Whatever we have to do to pull us out of this deep dive, we're going to do." We saw a little bit of that in March of 2020. I mean, in in, in terms of five trillion in money, and you know, almost five trillion in government expenditure and stimulus. This time, I believe you're going to see, because of what the nature of this global bust is going to be, and what it's going to take to stop a free-falling financial global financial system, I'm forecasting or certainly uh, suggesting that we might see as much as 20 trillion or more in uh, Fed balance sheet expansion. So we're at, let's say, we're slightly, you know, we're under a trillion now. That means you'll be, you know, probably somewhere around 30 trillion in the balance sheet. Unheard of. I mean, five trillion was unheard of. You know, remember in in uh, the fall of 2008, the balance sheet before they had to get active because of Lehman, the balance sheet was 875 billion. We're now we got up to nine trillion this past year, and we're you know we're slightly under that now, and I'm saying we're going to jump to 30 trillion next year or, or in the you know, 12 to 18 month period there. And every central bank's gonna do proportionally similar because that's what it's gonna take to try to turn, turn a free falling system around. And because of the leads and lags, they'll print money and nothing will be happening. They'll print some more money, nothing's happening. Uh, and by the time they're done, they'll have pushed out that kind of money. That will jumpstart an inflation cycle like we have never seen. In this country, certainly, we saw, you know, we saw 20% inflation rates in the early 80s. I think we're probably going to see 25% inflation by the end of this decade. Um, I would say the 25, 2025 to 2030 period in commodities will be the most robust commodity cycle ever. I'm and to put some numbers on that, I'm calling for $500 oil by the end of the decade. I'm calling for 20,000 gold by the end of the decade. I'm calling for $500 silver. Um, copper will be you know, through the roof at levels we've never seen. Um, all the base metals, same thing. You know, Natural gas will be at numbers we've never seen. Um, it's gonna be across the board. I think ag commodities will be big beneficiaries. Uh, it's funny how these cycles kind of work because you say, ag chemicals are, I mean, egg uh, commodities aren't necessarily driven by the Fed, but it will be because of a lot of policy over the years and just everything else that plays into it, it will be across the board, a commodity cycle that uh, will allow people if they want to, 
to build some real wealth, but they gotta be, you know, they gotta do it right. It's not a straight line. I've heard a lot of calls of commodity super cycle in the last two or three years and acting like, and talking about it running till the end of the decade or what have you. Yeah, I, uh, what happens next year to commodities is gonna be pretty severe. It's, gonna, it's not gonna dodge the bust so that you could see $1 gasoline next year. You could see oil at $30 next year. Uh, you could see natural gas at, at a dollar or lower. You could see uh, gold back to these levels. I'm forecasting 3000 pre busts, so, you know, rally now, but it could come back here. Silver, which is currently 24 or thereabouts, um, could run to 60 pre bust but then come all the way back here in the bust. So those, and maybe even lower. So those people who think they can just buy and hold commodities, just know next year's, I, I say next year is a lot like standing on the south rim of the Grand Canyon uh, today. Let's say today we're, we're on the south rim of the Grand Canyon and thinking I can buy commodities and walk straight across that, that to the north rim of the Grand Canyon with no effect. Well, guess what? There's a Grand Canyon in between. In commodities next year, it will be a big dive in prices. Uh, so you you have to be aware that um, there is, you know, it's not a straight line. There is that big V before you come out of it. But, but at the depths of the bust, those that are in commodities, you know, start accumulating commodities, I think will be rewarded very well um, between that period and the end of the decade. Well, you beat me to the punch on the next series of questions, were, which were basically prognostications on silver, gold, oil, even, well, we didn't get to quite corn and wheat and agriculture. We may pop on that in a second. Uh, but the ones that you mentioned, those numbers, oil 500, silver 500 was a gold 20,000, was towards the end of the decade. Like you said, it may get worse. Well, it will get a lot worse before it hits those highs. So if you had to look out a little bit more short term, not to the end of the decade, but maybe the end of next year, uh, do you see, I mean, the lows, like you said, oil, you think may get to even 20 or 30. What could happen to the most common commodity from, uh, geez, I was going to say hedging, but really it's arguably more deflationary. But the one that your audience and others are going to be familiar with is gold. What could we see it go down to before it eventually goes up to twenty thousand? Yeah, I, I first of all, I'm looking for gold here. I think I think we are beginning a very big move in the in the metals here. They've they've been very disappointing to investors, I guess. Right. Uh, even even though gold's not that far off its all time high, uh, it feels disappointing because the miners haven't done well and it's been kind of stuck here for a while. I think we're about to see gold break out to new highs. Uh, and I'm calling for 3,000 gold. Um, may not happen by the end of the year, it could, um, but it's certainly going to be early next year. So I'd say between the end of this year and the first quarter of next year, gold could go to 3,000. So that's a nice move, you know, big move, mo bigger move than we've had in gold in quite some time. Um, and, and then as the bus kicks in, and again, these aren't precise timing. So I don't want people trying to figure out, well, you're talking about a bust in 24, but you're still saying, oh, go, go, go up. Then, you know, it may be that it rallies a little bit early in the bust. It's not like a bell goes off and you say, well, we're in a bust now, gotta sell my gold. You know, they, you can have overlaps, but, um, but anyway, in the bust, um, I think gold can get back here. I don't, I don't see gold going you know, there's, there's forecasts of 1400 and below, you know, even some down to a thousand. I don't see gold getting hit that hard in the bust. I could be wrong, but I, I think gold probably has that big rally and then does a round trip back to here. Um, that's still, I mean, that'd be, that'd be, let's say 3000 back to two, you know, back to 1900 um, would be a big, you know, it'd be a, more than 50 per, well, it'd be, yeah, it'd be, uh, more than a 33%, you know, say a 35 to 40% correction, maybe, um, which makes sense. If, if equities are going down 80 and gold goes down half that, that would make sense to me because there's going to be reasons to want to own gold looking forward that you might not be ready to say equities look 
promising somewhere down the line. <laughs> yeah. and, and how about agriculture commodities uh, and a little bit of a part two of that? Will we have a food shortage crisis? Yeah, let me let me just finish out the price of metal. Silver, huh. silver, the more volatile metal. So I think silver can go from here to 60. Um, and then in a round trip, come all the way back here or maybe even below this because it's much more cyclically sensitive. So I wouldn't be surprised to see silver go from you know 24, 25 up to 60 and then back to 20. Um, That'd be, you know, that'd be a two thirds retracement or two thirds uh, correction to, you know, 60 plus percent correction. Um, but then, and, but then after that, obviously the big run in the commodity run. Um, in terms of ag, I don't have any targets. Um, I, I will say in the super cycle, in the, in the post bust cycle for commodities, I think it can go up multifold. You know, it won't be just a double. I think it can go up multifold. Um, and that's corn, wheat, soybeans, what have you. Um, and, and again, we're, I'm sure we're going to get to it at some point, so I won't talk about it yet. But there comes a cost to all of this. It may be good for the investor in commodities. It, it doesn't speak well to consumer wealth. I, I mean, to, to um, discretionary income. <laughs> doesn't speak well to what the consumer is going to be facing in terms of cost pressures. Um, so I think we have to take, you know, understand that, but, but from an investment standpoint, I think you're looking at a tremendous opportunity 2025 to 2030. And in terms of a food shortage, I have to say, there's a lot of evidence that our policies are direct, are, uh, look deliberate, that there are certainly things out there that suggest to me there's engineered food shortages. There may be food shortages that are not engineered that'll happen, but it, it certainly doesn't look like um, some of our governments are working in our favor. Yes, in more ways than one, which again, trying to come back a little bit to my title, uh, do you think that American or broadly international families in general should own ag, effectively own farms? Yeah, I, I do think that, well, I'll put it this way, because I can't, I can't recommend, but I will say this. I think real estate in general, if you follow my, my ultimate forecast, if we get that kind of hyperinflation, you're going to have hyper interest rates. You're going to have interest rates back up, I think, above the levels of the early 80s. That means the long bond above 15%, the 10-year long bond above 15% by the end of the decade. Uh, T bills may be at 20 or 25 um, percent. In other words, interest rates spiking dramatically uh, over over a five year period. Um, if you think that through, that means mortgage rates will be up there too. How in the heck does real estate do in a in a period of mortgage rates, you know, more than doubling from here and and obviously going a lot higher than they were just a couple of years ago? Um, I don't think real estate's an inflation hedge in that environment, because as you know, I mean, if you want to buy, if you want to pay cash, you don't worry about that. But for most people, buying a home is based on that mortgage rate. You know, you you double the the rate, and you're going to have a mortgage payment that's a lot bigger, you know, more than double. So, so I'm not, you know, people traditionally think real estate's an inflation hedge. I'm not sure it is in that environment. I that's a long way of saying. But the one area of real estate that I think will thrive in that commodity cycle will be farmland. I think farmland is the one area of real estate you probably can see appreciate uh, through you know post bust. And so, uh, yeah, certainly that's an area I would I would not be uh, shy looking at. And, and not to be nefarious, but of course, if the government do, doesn't like it, they could always eminent domain you or just take it from you for national security purposes. Of course, give you fair compensation. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> but that's a, a, a negative, nasty geopolitical perspective. We may get into it at a different time and we may nudge on it here and there. Uh, I'm going to ask you a series of probably seven or eight questions, maybe a little more. We'll go a little more quicker around Robin before we kind of talk a little bit about elections, allocation, and even the dollar. Uh, thinking for yourself, my audience knows that I say that a lot because we don't do it. 
thinking for yourself is the definition of a true contrarian. Do you agree? Um, it's certainly a piece of it. Let's put it that way. I think, I think um, understanding the discounting nature of markets, understanding um, what consensus is and, and its track record, et cetera, and when, when to be contrary, when not to be contrary, those are all parts of it. But um, yeah, certainly independent thinking is an important requirement if you're going to be a contrarian. Yes, and critical thinking in general. Uh, I yeah. think this is an important question. What causes you as a contrarian to change your views? Yeah, I'm, you know, as I say, I'm a macro strategist, so macro drives my work, but sentiment plays a very big role. Um, so sentiment will, you know, uh, I understand um, to be a contrarian uh, is important at both extremes. So I'm really very happy being a lone, lone gun or very lonely at tops and bottoms. That's when I expect to be most contrary and that's when I am typically most contrary and it doesn't bother me I actually like that. As, as we move through the cycle, consensus actually is a good thing. Um, you know, it, there's, there's a period when being contrary is gonna hurt you. So, so in the middle part of a move, um, yeah, I'm less, I'm less contrary. And so a lot of times it's, it's um, you know, it's what are the fundamentals telling me and I don't stick to my contrarian just to be contrary. Did the U.S. going off the gold standard in 1971 turn financial markets into a giant Ponzi scheme? It certainly was a big turning point in that, yes. I think the Ponzi scheme started before that, you know, but the the real acceleration of it started after that, and then it's just ramped up in the last 20 years. Well, we kind of asked these questions already, but you, let, let's let's still go for it. Will, will there be a, someone's asking this in the chat or in my text, actually, one of my live participants, what will be the catalyst for a deflationary bust causing a massive collapse in 2030? Yeah, so uh, uh, the bust, as I say, the bust is is 2024-ish, you know, it could spill into 2025, 20, um, and the catalyst is that massive leverage on the system, and again, you have to think beyond the United States, There's, this leverage is everywhere, it's a worldwide um, phenomena. It's, I don't think people really can grasp, when we say 300 trillion in debt, global debt, I, I think we all kind of go to the 300 and say, that's a number I can understand, 300. I don't think any of us really grasp 300 trillion and what the implications are of that. And to understand that it's gone from, you know, a trillion or a few trillion to 300 trillion in, in just a couple of decades. I mean, we're, we're talking about something that's unmanageable and that nobody can really wrap their head around. Um, so you've got that debt. Uh, and then you go to quadrillions in notional value of derivatives. Yes. And again, I don't think people wrap their head around the fact that what it was a quadrillion to begin with, and what's the implication of, of quadrillions in notional value? I mean, we don't know. We really don't know. All I know is it's, it's a lot more leverage than we've ever had before. And leverage is something I learned in business school, enhances returns on the way up and dev devastates returns on the way down. Yeah, and, and both yeah, returns- else, That would be pretty good in school at least. Yeah, and, and not just returns, it devastates economies and devastates yeah. businesses in, in that same uh, way. So, so you know, it, uh, catalyst is a hard word because catalyst in, in means you have to have some trigger for the downturn. I don't know what that ultimately, you know, the, the simple trigger will be to change from you know, the market topping out to all of a sudden you're going down a lot. What I do know is what's going to cause it. I do know what ultimately leads to it. And it's that leverage. It's, and it's a policy error. Uh, error. Um, now, in terms of how we get to the 2030s, which is I, I call 2024 a bust. I call the 2030s a systemic collapse. Uh, so, uh, you know, Next year, there'll be people calling it a recession, others calling it a depression, and I'm calling it a bust because it'll be bigger than 2008, 9, and you know, 
bigger financial system implications. But because of that printing press around the world, because of deflation, I can confidently say there's a recovery to follow that, that it's not going to be a depression, that it will be, you know, reversed quickly, relatively quickly. So, but what causes the 2030s to be a collapse where there's not a quick turnaround is that we have this huge inflation cycle that is caused by that massive ramp up of money. When, when, you know, when you print that kind of money that's unheard of, never seen before, with a lag, it's all of a sudden gonna ramp up into that 25% or more inflation. We, we have, and I'll just focus on our, our government debt, but we have ramped up our government debt in, in recent decades and certainly you know, so much more in the last couple of years, few years, to levels that we can barely service the debt with rates at three, four, five percent. What do we do when those rates, T bills, like I said, T bills may be 25 percent, and um, the 10 year may be, you know, 16, 17, 18 percent, and the 30 year may be there. There's yeah. no mathematical, yeah. there's, you know, there's no mathematical equation that can solve that, those numbers. Um, so you end up collapsing, you, know, you end up defaulting. And what I think a lot of people don't understand is that our, our scenario living has been dropping for many years. The only reason it's not noticeable is because of all the government expansion. You, oh, take, away, yes. <laughs> you take away the ability to say, okay, we have, you know, let's just take the last week, for example. You have all this weather going around the country causing all kinds of um, disasters. So you declare the disaster area and get disaster relief. Where's that money come from? It doesn't, you can't pull it off a tree. You can't take it down from the sky. It comes from floating more bonds, right? They, they sell more debt and say, okay, we have some more money. We'll, we'll build that into the equation. And, and that's fine when you have access to the capital markets. And of course the US have been lucky for a long time to be you know, the most sought after debt. There's going to come a time by the end of this decade where people are going to say, you know, investors are going to say around the world are going to say, "You're you're a mess. We're not we're not going to buy any of your debt. We have no interest in it. You're you know, you're a bankruptcy waiting to happen." And so, uh, people don't realize that once we lose the printing press, once we lose the ability to monetize the debt, um, and and that's the other thing. You can't, not only can, will the government lose access to capital markets, the Fed's gonna lose its printing press because just like a California forest fire, you pour gasoline on a fire and it's gonna be worse. So you know they're not gonna be able to print more money because it's only gonna accelerate inflation and, and it's a loser's game. You know, pretty soon the inflation's, you know, Weimar Republic type inflation, they'll stop before that. but. But so we're going to lose both the printing press and access to capital markets. That means the government has to shrink. And how does it, you know, because if, if your debt servicing costs are going through the roof and eating up all of your, your budget, there's no money left over for the military. There's no budget left over for welfare. There's no budget left over to fund the Social Security that you've outspent. There's no budget left over for Medicare and Medicaid. There's going to come a time in the 2030s I believe, and this is dire. And, and again, I'm talking about the US, but this is really gonna happen worldwide. There's gonna come a time, in my opinion, in the, in just looking at the US, where you potentially could have 50% plus unemployment rates, no welfare system, no unemployment, um, no, you know, very limited, if any, social security and Medicare and no Medicaid. I mean, what, and, and and no access to money. I mean, what what you know what happens in that event? You know, I don't think people understand. You've you've been propped up by the government for all this time, but as you called it before, it's a massive Ponzi scheme. Once it reverses, there's no stopping it until the bottom. And and unfortunately, that's that's you know that's I can't tell you what comes out of that but it's probably totalitarian. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these are issues that I have covered. Some of them have not been released yet. Uh, former Green Beret, E.M. Burlingame, 
uh, my work with Adam Robinson that I've done and other upcoming guests, uh, hopefully Scott Ritter soon, that we talk about these really deep and challenging issues. And imagine where the government really can't be self-supportive if something even like military and make no bones about it. Oh, we're surrounded by oceans on both sides. Uh, oh, we have contract law without backing of violence and force protection from military. It means nothing. Zero. We always spend too much on military until the day that we need it. It's supposed to be a deterrent and then it's supposed to be able to take action. And I can tell you right now, I've interviewed a gazillion Navy SEALs. I've interviewed in person General Wesley Clark and many others. The military we have now, there's some damn good people in it at the special elite areas, but up at the top, it is woke as woke can be. If you and think for a minute that we could defeat the Russians or China, I hate to tell you you're wrong. You're probably wrong. They have, mainly Russia, has what, their SARMET, their interballistic missiles that can't be picked up by our systems coming in from the South Pole that could destroy. Now, yes, we could likely then destroy them, but then the world is in chaos. To think that then we give that up, that we, it's, <laughs> this is a disaster. Since you went down that terrible path, it gets me a little, unfortunately, a little bit ramped up. And one of the projects that I do that I will make more available broadly that I've been talking about is that disaster prep for billionaires or those that want to be, and don't we all? And with inflation going crazy, probably being a billionaire in 12 years is going to feel like being worth only 20 million now. I have no idea. So what you're talking about with that level of weakening of the military, with woke, with unemployment, uh, we, the, now, yes, it is going to happen in many parts of the world, but I don't know. Right now, the Russian economy is doing a hell of a lot better than what the Western media is pointing it out to be. And how about China? Uh, I think there's a chance we could maybe remain self-sufficient and a little bit protective and away from that. But it is looking harder and harder all the time. I don't necessarily want to throw in some solutions. Uh, that is something for more of my master class series and program that I do. Uh, and, and I don't know if I really, there's no one great solution as you're describing it, which obviously I'm concurring and maybe even ramping it up a little more. If you had to give some advice to someone who has reached a level of financial success and is concerned about continuity within their family and they're living here in the U.S., what would you tell them? Are there certain states they're better off living in that are more protective of their, their freedoms, their rights and independence? Should they be owning gold? Should they be owning farms? Should they have optionality for freedom, for travel, for passports? And even then, then it just may not matter. Who knows? Yeah, I think you summarized pretty good. I'd say probably all of the above. But but the thing, what I tell both um, you know, small investors as well as large, because they, they hear that dire forecast of the 2030s. And, you know, I don't want people staying up all, you know, not going to sleep at night because they're worrying about something that's, you know, um, a decade away. Um, as I say, we have coming a melt up and a bus, two things that are going to be among the biggest in history in both directions. We have a commodity cycle unlike any we've ever seen. Before we ever get to the collapse, there are three big historical moves coming. So focus on the, the here and now, focus on meaning the next, certainly in this decade, and get your house in order. That's, that's my most general con, uh, comment is you have a chance. And again, I'm used to talking to people that don't have the wherewithal that some of the family offices do, but you have a chance. Um, in, in this decade to get your house in order. Don't blow it. Don't lose it all in, in the bust and, and the 80% bear. Don't, don't, uh, you know, don't get caught up in what I think is gonna be pretty um, ebullient in the next several months and, and forget that there's a, another side of the mountain. Um, and, and don't think you can just buy index funds or what have you that's worked for the last 20 years and have it work in the next cycle. Because I can tell you the things that have worked in the last 20 years are gonna be the things that are gonna fail you in the next seven. Um, for sure. And, and so, you know, it's- have, Sorry, David, continue. 
yeah so so it's really i i i don't have any answers for what you know first of all the 2030s is too far out for me to have the kind of conviction i have in in, in the nearer term and meaning in the next seven years but i just see it as inevitable i could be wrong on timing i could be wrong on magnitude so i don't want to scare people too much but i do think it as you said, there's a lot of policies that are going into this that are helping grease the skids to that that failure. Um, but I really would encourage people to focus near term. There's there's enough here that can get what you can do in the next seven years to set you up will allow you maybe to survive what comes after that. If you mismanage this next seven years, it's going to be a tough period after that. That's that's what I would say. And trust me, I think. American cities and other cities have some wonderful features to them. Great people, diversity, great food, culture, museums. Uh, they used to be more important to certain financial and other markets, but in today's world, at least while we still have growing technology, AI, not quite as valuable. But when things do hit the fan, being in that kind of environment is probably not going to be the best situation to be in which is why my American audience knows, but don't you all move here. We don't want you all. There's enough. I love Wyoming. I have my reasons in my master classes. I talk a little bit about that. It's not the only option. And there are other options from a global, uh, both from passports to how to own assets, to what type of assets, to art, to other things. And there is no one perfect answer. To think that you could own property and real estate and that title can't be altered in the future by nefarious governments or simply just taken from you. Now, you might be able to prove ownership at a point in the future when you could go back and get it. And from a digital perspective in an upcoming world of central bank digital currency, and more importantly, the programmable money aspect of it, what you have in terms of your liquidity, in terms of your cash and stocks, in an upcoming future, you're going to feel somewhat hand tied on that by quote unquote, the powers that be in the government. There may be certain solutions and independence that we could have in the US that doesn't head down that path, but it's probably looking a little bit unlikely. But again, I did state there is a masterclass that I delve into these issues that I'll be launching this fall of 2023 and simply contact me directly. And it's not just me, it's a dream team of people that I bring in to address these issues. I've been dealing with billionaires and family offices for 20 years. Uh, hopefully I've gained just a little bit of knowledge of what could work for them in such a scenario. Uh, two questions came in from the chat. I think to a degree we kind of covered them, but before I we head to the home stretch in the final 10 minutes, will this commodity super cycle span several years or even decades? Yeah, it's not decades. It's it's I really believe it's pretty much focused in the 2025 to 2030 area. Um, you know, again, it can stretch, but commodity cycles tend to be short. If you look at our economic cycles, and if you kind of ignore the pandemic to an extent and understand that was very sharp and short, we really have had an elongated cycle from 2009 or 2010 to today was separated by that pandemic, a little bit artificial. Um, and the cycle before that was elongated. The consumer driven, disinflation driven cycles tend to be elongated the commodity driven inflation cycles tend to be short and sharp. So I, I, is it possible that it carries over for a couple of years into the next decade? Certainly. Do I, that's not my, my best guess. My best guess would be that it, you know, my kind of now the 2030s uh, or the 2025 to 2030 is kind of a, a good guess right now, but I definitely don't think it, it's not gonna survive um, the collapse. It's, it's going to, at some point, the reason it's short, by the way, is because when you get that kind of a ramp up, when you print that much money and it goes, you know, feeds on inflation, um, it, you know, inflation ramps up and commodity prices ramp up, there reaches a point where it just collapses the rest of the economy or the economy can't, can't move forward with that. And then, you know, and, and policy has to um, go after it and try to bring rein it in. Those all are are cycle shortening um, policies. So, so the reason it's short is because inflation ultimately can't be sustained at those levels. It just keeps building. Um, so my answer would be very likely it's short. 
you know, meaning five, six, seven years at the most. The reserve currency of the world is currently the dollar. It has been since Bretton Woods. If you look at certain cycles that are spoken about, we're probably at a point where that's probably going to be challenged. Although admittingly, people have been saying that for years and it hasn't quite happened yet. But we are seeing now the rise of the BRICS, the rise of Russia and China, specifically of India upcoming, of other countries, and a little bit of anti-U.S., and not wanting to be under the thumb of the American, the CIA, the government, and what we do to basically force, quote unquote, others relative to uh, our policies and what we do. So times are changing. It's just the reality of it. As they begin to back what they're doing by at least some form of commodities, it appears to be inevitable that the dollar being the almighty may still run for a couple of more years, but it's not going to last forever. I, I, I probably have a hard time seeing it last as the total all force of power 10 years from now. Uh, how do you think that will play out and what's going to happen with the dollar? Yeah, I am. Um, I'll separate it two ways. One, one is definitely, you know, talking about, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion out there about losing our reserve status. Um, I am in the camp that believes we probably don't lose reserve status this decade or certainly in the next five years, but we do. We do see that we're, you know, it's going to be a diminishing uh, influence, and so I don't make light of that. I think that's happening. Um, totally separate, it, it has an influence on what I'm going to say in terms of what I, my forecast is for the dollar. But my my dollar forecast is, and it's not because of that. It may have some influence on it. Is that we're we're going to see the dollar drop from it just fell through 100 on the DXY. I'm forecasting 80 in the next six to eight months, um, that's a huge drop. Again, it's not, and it's not a drop that's permanent. It's not a drop that means we've lost reserve currency or anything, or reserve status or anything like that. There may be some of the concerns about that that will be part of that. Um, but that's pure, you know, looking at the dollar technically and fundamentally from a world, uh, you know, global macro standpoint, that's what I see here in the next eight months. After that, in the bust, I do believe the dollar is gonna do what it always does and it's gonna be the, the currency that the world runs to for safety because keep in mind this global bust is gonna hit others harder than us even. So, so the dollar is still gonna be that currency that people say, yeah, it may have been tarnished some, but we still know that their rule of law is better than the rest. You know, we still know that they manage their economy better than the rest. Um, we still have faith that their government will come and, and back their, their bonds if we buy them and back their currency. So you will see the dollar get bid up. I'm projecting 120 plus, so it could go to 140, but whatever. So you're gonna have in 2024 and probably into 2025, well into 2025, a dollar that runs to 120, 125 you know, 130, 40, um, that, that should not be seen as a sign that that whole talk about losing reserve status is, is false. It's just, a, you know, I think the bust is gonna distract a lot of governments and a lot of uh, naysayers or a lot of, a lot of policymakers from doing something that may hurt the dollar. I think they're gonna be focused on their own problems. So as a result, I think you've got, you know, you've got that, kind of postponement of, of that concern. But I think second half of this decade, I think the dollar can fall to 50 or below by the end of the decade. Part of that will be a, you know, a diminishing reserve status. Part of it will be the inflation story and, and, the, and basically the realization that how are, we gonna, how are we gonna get out of this mess, you know? Other, others, we, we know a lot of emerging countries, emerging, um, um, economies have problems. We've always, people have always looked at the U.S. as the king, you know, the one that could stand above that and not have to worry about that. We're going to start joining all those problems. So, so I think it's, uh, you know, the dollar is going to, on a relative basis, lose, lose value versus other fiat currencies. And then add in there whatever China and Russia are going to do with the BRICS and have any success with and I don't I just don't know because don't 
don't forget, I think what one thing I would caution everybody on is, and I'm guilty of this too, as we all live here and see the, the warts we have, but whatever warts we have, there are bigger ones in China. There are bigger ones in Russia. There are, you know, there are a lot of things, and I'm not talking about the military because I think we are, we are really making a mess. We we are falling behind very big time militarily. But in other ways, let's not forget that the the, the leverage we have in our system, China's is much worse. <laughs> the um, the you know the economic resilience we have. Russia has none of that. So there are things where it's not a given that those guys can step in and fill a void on, on currency reserve. I, I, I realize gold is part of what they're planning. I, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not so convinced that just because they wanna bring our downfall currency wise, that they can do it. They, you know, the, we, we are far, you still have to prove to me that the U.S. isn't the far superior economy um, policy is notwithstanding. I mean, you know, the, the Fed notwithstanding, the, uh, you know, the massive mess being made by the Biden administration notwithstanding. You know, we still are the uh, entrepreneurial country out there, and I'm, I'm not sure that's about to change. Uh, probably the final one, Goldman Sachs 2023 Family Office Investment Insight shared uh, their research on a block of, I think it was several hundred family offices. Some of the broad allocations uh, were approximately 28% to public market equities, 26% to private markets, aka private equity, 12% to cash, 10% to fixed income, 9% to real estate, 6% to hedge funds, 3% to private credit. Yes, I know it's going to be hard to remember all this. And a lowly 1%, what are the Goldman Sachs family offices doing? A lowly 1% to commodities. Is there anything that I said that stood out to you as, oh boy, someone's going to be in some trouble in the coming year or two? Yeah, a few things. One, yeah, that is very glaring. 1% commodities really fits into that scenario of what we're going to have as a super cycle, because that allocation is going to grow tremendously as as other areas have to lose. Um, one area I really wanna focus on is private equity. Uh, I would tell people having been in this business as long as I have, I was there through the Milken years and the, during the Milken years, what was private equity? It was known as leverage buyouts, right? Today, ah. we, we changed the name to private equity because leverage buyout got kind of a bad name in those, you know, with Milken and everything. So, but really private equity means you're you're basically taking companies private and leveraging up the balance sheet and you know taking away the public equity um, endowments and public pension funds in particular i guess um, family offices as well obviously and others have all kind of gravitated to private equity because it was you know they saw this more stability less volatility um, and my problem with private equity is it's if you're if you're going into a period where where leverage is is disaster, it's a it's a very highly leveraged area. <laughs> so I think private equity is going to be um, a real problem for endowments, you know, for the Harvard endowment and all those that have accumulated for for um, anybody that's decided that that's a better place than public equities. I mean, it's not it's not that it's not going to you know public equity is going to hurt you really badly but if you think you're in private equity and you're safer i i think be careful with that one it's going to also get hit hard um bonds i will say from a longer standpoint uh they're actually they surprised me how low they are i think you said nine percent in bonds yes, correct um it's surprisingly low and i think that's it's it's premature but i think it's smart uh, from the standpoint of the, the light allocation there relatively, because, um, you know, in the forecast post bust, you know, I'm calling for a move from, well, let me talk about the bust first. The bust, I, I think in the bust, I think the 10 year can get to zero or below. And I say below, because if, if the Fed's going to be printing $20 trillion, the U.S. government is going to be putting out equal amount of bonds. They're going to monetize the debt. It's going to be it's going to be fiscal and monetary expansion like we've never seen. 
if uh, as well, well, there's 20, it's going to be a lot. The Fed's going to have to find bonds everywhere they can find them to monitor to get that money in the system, right? To do QE. Um, that means you're going to be you're going to have demand through the roof, and of course, in, investors are going to be seeking out safety like never before. And the most safe security out there still is the U.S. government um, securities because of the Fed, they can print money and, and buy those. So, so in other words, it's gonna be tremendous demand for, for treasuries in the bust. So I expect negative, potentially negative rates on the, on the 10 year. The 30 year probably doesn't get the negative. They probably get down to a quarter, maybe a half, but probably a quarter. Short rates, short treasury bill rates and other short rates Fed funds are gonna go negative as much as the Fed doesn't wanna ever see that. So, um, so there is one more bull market in bonds uh, into the bust um, or through the bust. I'm not sure exactly when when that bottoms out, but but and bonds top out. But from that point forward, you're going to go from zero or less rates on a ten year, for example, to fifteen to twenty percent rates in a five year period. If I'm right. You do not want to own a bond. <laughs> you may you you can be fine with uh, ninety day T bills and rolling them every. That'd be a great strategy. Roll them every three months or every six months. Be a great strategy in a inf highly inflationary environment. Um, so short short as short duration, shorter the better will be the story after the bust. But you're probably a, a year premature in being light in bonds today. Um, but but I would say generally, if that if that remains the allocation, you're going to be better off than most people. And you meaning family offices, uh, relative to most institutions, because obviously most institutions are you know, probably closer to thirty or forty percent bonds at least. So, um, so looking from a longer term standpoint, I have no problem with the bonds, but just don't know that you're probably a year early. And we do have to start to wrap up right before we do that. I wanted to get a little more political, but I probably only have time for one question. We probably got to keep the response a minute to 90 seconds. Uh, put on your prognosticators hat. We're not that far from upcoming in about, what, 15 more months presidential U.S. elections. Uh, what would be the impact if you could be a little bit more politically correct and say, Republicans win, Democrats win, or if you want to get a little bit more Republicans represented by Trump or DeSantis or Democrats by who knows, I don't even know, Gavin Newsom, uh, uh, who we have now with President Biden. I'll, I'll, I'll let you some freedom to talk however you want about that. Okay. Um, thanks for the freedom. You're, you're, uh, <laughs> Just don't I'm get us in trouble get, on I'm, YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get, get in trouble with some people, I'm sure. Um, I, I, there's there's no question there's a there's a choice there it's not you know it's not um we're basically in the same place either way i i think what i you know i think my global view is inevitable uh, or my my uh, global bust is inevitable i don't know if the global bust is inevitable but an ultimate you know real problem out there over the next 10 years is inevitable no matter who's in office um but i will say that it does make a difference who you elect um you know, the policies of, of the left of Biden and, and Obama are far less capitalistic and are really uh, seemingly um, either it's deliberate, which it very well may be, or, or it's they're, they're really totally oblivious to economic law. But what they're doing is, is greasing the skids for, you know, New world order, it seems, where we basically are not in the lead anymore, and uh, not even close, even if you ignore the 2030s. So that versus um, a Trump or DeSantis will go back, bring us back to at least more capitalistic policy, more um, economically sound policy. And, you know, either one of those, I think, could do that. I will say, and this is not what you asked, uh, and this is where I can get into trouble. Um, I will say this idea out there that the Democrats want Trump and that, you know, a lot of Republican establishment and certainly the candidates competing against Trump 
in the primary are trying to argue that Trump's not electable. I'm not so sure about that. I really think that the Democrats are, they may may want Trump, but I think there's a real chance that they are scared to death of Trump and they're, they're putting out a, uh, you know, they're trying to convince you that they, they want Trump because they don't want him. Um, I, I think Trump is the only one, uh, and I don't mind DeSantis if he, if he gets in, but I think Trump is by far the only one that you can be assured will have the backbone to stand up against the clear new world order agenda that's out there. And that new world order agenda is being carried out by both the rhinos and the left. It's not just Democrats pushing that, it's both. So I would not be so quick to abandon Trump and say he's not electable. I think everybody on the other side wants you to believe that because he is the only one with proven record of being willing to stand up to it. He, he not, you know, and I think he learned a lot last time about who he can trust and, you know, about the nefarious nature of the deep state. And I think that anybody else that comes in, maybe with the exception of Ramaswamy, um, is going to have a is going to have a learning curve that Trump went through. Maybe not quite as big because you know some things were made clear, but but I I don't think anybody but Trump can come in hitting the ground running against the deep state. I mean, he's the one person who I don't think he's going to mince words against them or think think any more that he can kind of play play the middle against them. I think I think DeSantis or any of the other you know Nikki Haley any of the others they're going to come in and try to be business as usual. And, you know, that's not where we're at. We're, we're definitely in a war for this country. <laughs> yeah, well, we are in a civil war. It's a cold civil war now. It's not yeah. hot. And God forbid, I hope it never does get that way. Right. right. But yeah, who knows? There's dark horses with 15, whatever, 16 months to go. Uh, Rob Schwami, who you noted, maybe the mayor of Miami, Suarez, uh, uh, you know, RFK Jr. We just really don't know. <laughs> As we start to get a little closer, which is still a while ago, we'll definitely get very political, especially heading into next year. And want to be fair to both sides. I probably do have skew to one side, which you could probably tell. That doesn't mean I'm always right. That doesn't mean that I'm not respectful of the other side. And certain things, I might even agree with them on more of a social perspective. So I try to be open-minded, not be rigid. And yes, sometimes I do believe I get new facts, information, and I change my mind. What's wrong with that? Uh, but for the most part, what you said, I'm probably pretty well down with. But, but again, let me, you know, if I... If I could just say one last thing, because I oh, think course. again, because it's gonna you're gonna reach people on both sides, and sure, uh, and you know, it's so easy. To, you know, if somebody starts promoting Trump or talking positively about him, people just shut their ears. Um, I just want, and and you know, certainly there's a lot of young people who really are focused on the social issues. I just want people to step back and understand. That if if I'm anywhere near correct about the economic uh, picture coming over the course of the next decade, all the things you worry about in term you meaning those that are particularly on the left or those that uh, don't want to go where where we went on on you know the um, Trump and the New World Order, et cetera. If we get what I'm calling for or what I think is happening in the next decade. You can forget about climate change agenda. You can forget about yeah. Um, survival is going to be your biggest yeah, problem. Survival is going to be the entire energy, story, which means healthy. your entire your entire focus right. in twenty twenty four should be on two things: fighting the new world agenda. If anybody still doesn't believe that's going on, you are blind. Um, there is a definite, deliberate effort to weaken this country from within, and I say that with no bones. Um, and and um, fighting um, the ignorance of what economic policy. I mean, there's just, you should have a sole focus on economics. That's what, and, and again, there are not two parties that understand economics. The, the proposals that come from the Democrats, and I'm ignoring social stuff. I'm just focused on, you know, the fiscal. The proposals that come from the Democrats are economically bankrupt and it's not because i want to be partisan or anything and there's plenty of rhinos there's plenty of republicans that have done terrible things fiscally i'm not 
I'm not saying they're they're um, free of, of blame for this stuff, but from an economic perspective, the policies you're seeing proposed are proposing. It's it's like they think there's there's no limitations. You know, we can. You know, uh, I go, I'm running a little long, but MMT is a it's a bankrupt theory. No one should believe that somehow you can have your cake and eat it too, which means um, you can keep spending government money and you can find a way to pay for it through the printing press. We're seeing why you can't do that. And my explanation of what's coming is why that doesn't work. MMT assumes you can keep inflation under control and just keep spending money. It, it, it's a bankrupt theory. It's no, not a theory. It's a sure. It's bankrupt nonsense. So, so understand that the left pushes that thesis and believes in that, or at least that's how they operate their their policy. And at least some on the right have some physical discipline and understand that 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 doesn't work. So, so understand, twenty twenty four is our last chance to have any chance of stopping what I think is coming in the twenty thirties. Very well said. We'll leave it at that in the essence of time. David Hunter, of course, great to have you on. For those that would like to follow you on Twitter, how could they do so? I'm sure I'm on Twitter pretty much every day getting, um, I'm getting a few pats on the back now, but for a while I'm getting beat up. Um, so you can find me at Dave H. Contrarian. And I caution, make sure when you see, you can, you can, Call me up and you'll see my profile picture and then find out it's not me. It's easy to be fooled. There are a lot of fake accounts out there. And the way they go fake is they change your Twitter handle by a little bit. So it looks like you, yes. but it's, you know, they use your profile. They, they will copy my quotes to make it look like it's me. And sometimes they'll, they'll say something different than I would say, but they make it sound like me. Um, and so they might change a letter in contrarian or something. So be very is buyer beware, be very careful. I tell people the way you can tell it's me, I've got 193,000 followers. Most of the fake accounts are, you know, small number of followers, less than a thousand typically. Um, so, um, you know, first of all, look out for that, but I am on there and it's, it's at, at Dave H, not David, but at Dave H contrarian. Um, and if I could just say, I also uh, put out a quarterly investment letter macro letter. Uh, it's by subscription. So there's a cost to it. If anybody has an interest in that, um, they can reach out to me by direct message. I, I don't promote it on Twitter itself. But if you direct message me on Twitter, I'll be glad to provide details. That's wonderful. And I highly recommend at minimum, you definitely subscribe to uh, David's Twitter, learn more about him and his great work. And I do recommend that you also reach out to him with a DM and subscribe to what he's doing. I think it's wonderful. Uh, it's great to, as always, have David on and Lord knows heading into later this year and into next year, not only will we have David, but it's just so much to cover at such an engaging time. You need the right information. And then again, you need to put it together and form your own conclusions, think for yourself and make your own decisions. I am also in wrapping up on Twitter, but David is much, much, much larger than me. I'm at Family Office on Twitter, but I'd like to grow, so follow me too. As I noted, uh, YouTube is probably my main platforms as I'm growing what I'm doing with my interviews. I'm two channels, at Family Office and at Family Office TV. Subscribe to both. Also on Spotify, iHeart, Apple, et cetera, for the podcast. And I do some different things on all platforms. So I'd recommend subscribing to all and hopefully you'll enjoy it. And those of you that note that I probably should have others from different perspectives on, I agree. If you have a recommendation, share them with me, make an intro. I'm happy to learn more about them and more than willing to have varying points of view and opinions on. Sometimes I can learn and sometimes it's a good back and forth. My email is angelo at angelorobles.com and my new platform at angelorobles.com. It's not so great now, what's up? But by August 15th, it'll be awesome and it'll have everything that I'm doing and then more, including the masterclass series of coming this fall that I mentioned earlier. Thank you all so much. I hope you enjoyed it. And David is always great for having you on. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks, Angelo. Enjoyed it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.